Well, hello, everyone. Phil Giuliani here again on Messianic Lamb Network. And this program is One in Messiah. We're here every week at this time. And then it's also on Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. But One in Messiah is a ministry that connects te- uh, passages from the Tanakh and the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, and shows how everything in Torah and everything about the prophets and everything in the writings is about Yeshua and how it all points to him. And as he said in John chapter 5, verse 39, all the scriptures testify of me. And I started this ministry about seven and a half years ago now because there was a lot of interest here. I'm in the Cleveland, Ohio area. A lot of interest in finding the Hebrew roots of the faith, the study of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, as it applies to Yeshua, the Messiah. And we have a, um, a live one in Messiah, which is every Friday night. And if you're in the uh, greater Cleveland area, we meet at 709 Brook Park Road. That's 709 Brook Park Road. And we have kind of a modified Arab Shabbat service where we do some music and I do a teaching. And then we have either some fellowship time or prayer time or question and answer time or whatever. And we, of course, celebrate the feast days and learn how Yeshua fulfills them. And everything we do is about how Yeshua fulfills the passages that we study in the Tanakh. So if you're in the area and you can stop by, we gather there at about 6.15. We generally start about 6.30. We'd love to have you pop in and say hello and meet you. And then also, since I'm advertising, um, th- these teachings here from Lamb Network, as well as the ones from One in Messiah, and as well as some other, many other miscellaneous teachings, go on my YouTube channel. Uh, the address for that is One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries. One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries. I know it's kind of an awkward title, but there's a long story behind that, which we're not going to get into at this point. But it comes from the days where I was technologically not very, very bright. Now I'm kind of minimally bright, at least. But anyway, <laughs> so One in Messiah, Gift of Grace Ministries on YouTube. Um, I also did have a YouTube channel called The Torah Class. Now, when you type in The Torah Class, I found out yesterday a lot of other video channels come up and you kind of have to scroll down until you see a red powerpoint plus or minus my picture on it and there are um 33 lessons on torah it's um a study well i don't know about a study but it's a torah course i put together some years ago now where it was meant originally for christians who didn't know anything about Torah. And so it it's it's in 33 parts. They're about an hour and a quarter each long. So it's quite a time commitment. So that's why I thought a couple of years ago, if I started putting it on, if I put it on a YouTube channel, then people could watch it at their leisure. And of course could stop and <laughs> take it as much as they could stand and then say, I'll get back to this some other time. But um, I've done that live in many places, but now it's on that YouTube channel called The Torah Class. And then since I'm advertising, I also have a podcast, which now has, I don't know, 800 and some episodes or programs or whatever you want to call it. But you can find the podcast. It's called Dr. Phil slash Gift of Grace. Dr. Phil slash Gift of Grace. And there's two websites, soon to be a third one when I'm done putting it together. But the two existing websites are www.oneinmessiah.website. 
Yes, website is the suffix or whatever it's called. One in Messiah dot website. The other one is www.giftofgraceministries.org. That's giftofgraceministries.org. <clears throat> Those pages have a lot of Bible teachings um, on the Gift of Grace site. All my radio shows that I do here on a local Christian channel are archived going back to the beginning of 2009. So there's a lot of stuff you can access, but enough for advertising since we're already into the show. And as you know, if you've watched this before, and as I always find out when I do anything, time goes fast. I really want to spend this program talking about Israel and not only talking about the Israel that we know today, but also the relationship between God and the land of Israel, which we know through not only the Tanakh, but also through the Gospels, through the letters, and also in the book of Revelation. Now, as you know, and I'm sure if you're watching this network, you have spent a lot of time studying the Tanakh, and you are involved in messianic ministry, ministries of various kinds. And um, I'm sure that you've, you've studied this, you understand, basically, I mean, probably more than I do, the things I'm going to bring up. And it's really impossible to list every single scripture where God talks about the land, and they just call it the land from time to time, because I think that uh, really connects what we're talking about. And I should say land with a capital L, for want of a better way to, to emphasize it. And I'm sure you've probably thought, before we get into it, I'm, I'm thinking, as I'm saying all this, that I'm sure you've thought in the past that there is a very strong connection between the land and the people. And if you know a little bit about history in terms of how the state of Israel was formed, the modern state, I should say, we're going to get to the ancient state in a minute. But how the modern state of Israel was formed, everything that led up to its uh, founding, starting, well, starting in the late 1800s, actually going back to the year 70 AD, but from the 1890s when the um, Zionist movement began, and it began in Europe, of course. It began in Germany, in Switzerland, in in England. <clears throat> there were congresses that met in Switzerland and in Germany. Uh, Theodor Herzl was the main leader of the movement. And we'll talk about him in a second, but at that time, there were essentially no Jews in the land. There may have been a couple of thousand. Don't really know for sure. Um, the land was under control of the Ottoman Turks, who, by the way, built the wall around the city that we know. And if you've been there, it's actually kind of a cool wall. It's a very nice wall. I'm sure it looks nicer than the ancient wall, but the Turks actually built that wall in the 1500s. So that, of course, is not the original wall around the city. And in fact, this, the original city that Jesus would have known was smaller than, than the current walled part of the city, or it's, it's usually called the old city. but. Um, the people were not in the land. 
And as you know, after 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, most of the city was destroyed. Jews were massacred all over the city. The Roman emperor turned it into a pagan city, changed the name of the city to Aurelia Capitolina, which was dominated by a huge statue of Jupiter, <coughs> who was the Roman equivalent of Zeus, as I'm sure you know. But every Jewish trace was removed from the city, and it became basically a pagan city. And the people then, as you know, there were some rebellions, the, the fighting at Masada, which kind of ended the whole, pretty much ended all of the rebellions. The people were dispersed from there, from the land into, as the prophet Ezekiel would have noted, all the four corners of the earth and went into this great diaspora that lasted almost 1900 years, just under 1900 years from 70 ish AD to 1948. So, all that time, the people were not in the land. So, you know, the history there were. Muslim for uh, first there was the, the Romans were there, the Eastern Romans were there, the Muslims swept in after Muhammad, the Crusaders went in to get rid of the Muslims, the Crusaders left, the Muslims came back, uh, eventually the Ottoman Turks. And so the land of Israel that we know today, well, the whole land that's described in the Tanakh was under control of many, many different foreign powers, and the people were not there. So how, what did the land look like? Well, I always like to point out that in the 1860s, Mark Twain went there and absolutely hated it. It was hot. There were no people. He said there was not a green thing growing. He went to Jerusalem and just didn't even know what to make of it. It was, it was dirty. It was un, it was just disgusting. And he couldn't believe that that was Jerusalem. But he wrote quite a bit about it. You can read it. And the name of his book escapes me now. So think about a pilgrim. But anyway, whatever. Um, if you Google Mark Twain and... The Holy Land, I'm sure you'll find accounts of his of his trip. And then Theodore Herzl himself went there in the mid-1890s and was appalled by what it looked like. The Jews of Europe, of course, had never been there. There would have been no way to go there. And he was appalled at what the city looked like. He said that the city was dirty, that there were rats everywhere, that it was a totally disgusting place, and suggested to his associates that maybe they should look for a new land, which, of course, <laughs> he didn't entertain for very long because that is the land, the land, that was given to Abraham and the patriarchs and the people. There's no other land. The British offered the Zionist Council, the Zionist Congress, some land in East Africa. I think it was in current day Uganda, which of course the British controlled most of East Africa. And they said, well, why don't we just make a homeland for the Jews there? And although that would have been easier and probably more peaceful, the Zionist Congress, of course, said, no, we can't do that. We have to go to that land. 
We have to go to the land of Canaan, the land that was given to Abraham, because that is the promised land. That's the land that was given to our people. That's the land of our of the patriarchs and our fathers. And that is the place where God put his name. Jerusalem is the place where God put his name. And this is why all the sacrifices had to be done at Jerusalem, had to be done in the temple. Because God specifies in Torah that the sacrifices could only be done in the place where God puts his name. And so that is the city. It's the city of the king. It's a place where the Messiah had to go to make his final sacrifice, to do the ultimate sacrifice that brings us our salvation, because all the sacrifices had to be made in Jerusalem, because that's where God put his name. So the idea of making a homeland in East Africa or Colorado or any place else you can name is out of the question. And so, of course, the state of Israel is established in 1948. And on that very same day, war is declared against it from all of its Arab neighbors they were attacked on all sides by their Arab neighbors. They didn't even have an army, but what's called the War for Independence began. And of course, Israel was triumphant, except that they only had half of Jerusalem. So there's a lot of history connected with the land that we know. Now, over the last week and a half to two weeks now, we have all seen what is going on there. There was the war in 1948. There was the war in 1956. There was the war in 1967, which was a pivotal one because, of course, Jerusalem was reunited, which is huge, not only in secular history, but in spiritual prophetic history. But the city was reunited. And then, of course, the war in 73. Those were the main wars. Israel was overwhelmingly victorious in all of them. Had those wars lasted another couple of days, the Israelis would have been in Cairo and in Damascus. Then there have been smaller wars, Lebanon wars. But what we saw happen from Hamas was something that's not been known before, was a well-planned, horrible terrorist action against innocent, unarmed people, because these brave warriors only can kill unarmed people, then they hide behind women, old people, and children, put their weapons in hospitals and schoolyards and wouldn't think about attacking the Israeli military. This was a demonic terrorist attack. And I'm not going to recount all that because I'm sure, like me, you have been watching the news. All, all, I've been watching almost constantly from that day that all this began. So... There's a piece of land, and it's a pretty small country. It's as big as New Jersey, and almost half of it's not even inhabited because it's the Negev Desert. Most of the people live in the northern probably two-thirds of the country. And other than a lot in the very far south, there's not much between Beersheba and there. Regardless, it's a small geographic area. There's only 8 million and some people now. And this is the piece of real estate on earth that God is most concerned with. Why? I don't know. Sovereignly picks this land to give to Abraham. 
and the other patriarchs. And there are more beautiful places in the world. The Rocky Mountains are very beautiful. There's beautiful waterfalls in Africa and in New Zealand and South America. And there's beautiful rivers and beautiful forests. But this piece of real estate is where God has his eye. In fact, it's where he put his name, capital N. So I think you'd agree that if you have a piece of land and God says, this is where I put my name, it means something very, very special and very, very powerful. There's no other place on earth where God said, that's where I put my name. He says, the whole earth is mine. This is the place I love. So let's talk a little bit about some references to this from the scripture. Like I said, all of you watching probably know a lot more about this than I do. You probably come up with 28 more scriptures. <laughs> and I could and I could have probably come up with at least six or seven more, but I didn't want to just get kind of bogged down in scripture after scripture after scripture, but kind of tie some things together in an order that shows why this land is so important, why these people are so important. And my 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 way of looking at chosen people, you know, the chosen people originate with Abraham, who at the time he's quote chosen is a 75 year old man who's living in present day Iraq and is wealthy, owns a lot of stuff. And he becomes the father of the people. He becomes Abraham, the father of the nations. And of course, he's also the father of the Arabs. He's not just the father of the Jews. And for us Gentiles who are following Messiah Yeshua, who follow the Jewish Messiah, we are Abraham's spiritual children. Now, why do I say that? Well, as we're going to see, and you already know, God makes promises to Abraham. You know, Abraham goes on a journey from the land of Ur to Canaan, goes on a journey to the present day Israel, which I don't know how many hundreds of miles it is, but he hurries and goes on the journey. He doesn't take weeks to think about it. God doesn't say, give it some time, see what you think. Let me know in a couple of months what you want to do. <laughs> Talk it over with your wife. See if you can get all your stuff in order here. Then you can start out. No, he goes immediately. God tells him to go immediately. Pick up and go. Pick up all your stuff and go. And go now. And he obeys. As the writer to the Hebrews says and other places, Abraham believed and it was counted as righteousness. Abraham obeyed and it was counted as righteousness. Now, was Abraham the most righteous guy in the world? Probably not. Was he the richest guy in the world? Probably not. Was he the most amazing, awesome, intelligent guy in the world? Probably not. Was there something about him that God said, well, that's the one I want to talk That's I got to pick him? Probably not. But he sovereignly picked to begin a group of people called the chosen people. Why did, why did there have to be chosen people? Chosen for what? Why did there have to be chosen people? Well, number one, it was the way God revealed himself. He revealed himself to those people. He made a covenant with those people. Revealed his nature, revealed his law, revealed all of the
aspects, attributes about himself to these people. And those people became the biological origin of Messiah's body, of his humanity, as Jesus of Nazareth. We know Messiah had to be the God-man. He had to be 100% divine and 100% human. Well, he was, in fact, human based on this line of people that begins with Abraham. So the chosen people get the revelation of God with the covenant, and they bring about Messiah. And this is why, of course, Satan hates them, and there's always been anti-Semitism in various forms, sometimes horrible, unbelievable, and sometimes more subtle, but there always is anti-Semitism. But one thing God says, and I'm going to get to the slides now before the, the time is up. God says Israel is the apple of his eye. You know, this comes from Zechariah chapter 2, uh, verse 8 where it says, he who touches Israel touches the apple of my eye. So that sounds nice, and we know that. And we have that phrase in our language. We say, oh, so-and-so is the apple of my eye, or, oh, this place is the apple of my eye. Or we really are connected to this. You know, I'm really connected to this person. He or she's the apple of my eye. Well, what you have to understand about this phrase, of course, is that in Hebrew, the word for apple is the same as the word for the pupil of the eye. So two things. Number one is God has Israel right in his eye, right in the pupil of his eye. And secondly, as he says in that verse, he who touches Israel touches the pupil of my eye. In other words, if you go against Israel, you're poking God in the eye. So that's a pretty strong connection, the apple of his eye. And let's see if I can make this a little bit better here. And so let's, let's go through some of these scriptures. This is going back to Genesis 12. Now the Lord, Yahweh, all capital letters, means God's name. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing to all the communities of the earth, to all the nations of the earth, to the Goyim. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's kind of an unusual thing to say to a 75-year-old man who doesn't have any children. He's going to be blessed. He's going to have land. He's going to have descendants. And through him, all the Goyim, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Are going to be blessed. Well, how can that be? Well. Because from him, from his seed, so to speak, is going to come Messiah Yeshua. It's going to come Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. The physical man, Jesus of Nazareth, is coming from Abraham. And we as Gentiles, living 4,000 years later, 3,700 years later, whatever it is, are blessed because of Abraham. That was the promise. So there was a promise to the first patriarch. Verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. He didn't have any descendants. He's 75. His wife Sarai is old. The book of Hebrews says they were, Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead. And then they had Isaac. So God says, I'm going to give you, to you and your descendants this land. What land was he talking about? 
He wasn't talking about Colorado. He wasn't talking about India. He wasn't talking about some place in China. Genesis 15. To your descendants, I have given this land. You already have given it. From the river of Egypt, the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gersh, Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So I've given you this land. Now, this is much bigger than the current land of Israel. This goes from the Nile to the Euphrates. And by the way, for those of you that have spent time studying the book of Revelation, the Euphrates River has dried up. So I think we're getting pretty close. The Euphrates has dried up. It's turned into a little stream, or it used to be the great river Euphrates. So God says, I'm giving you this land, and it's a huge piece of land. These promises are recounted then to Jacob, Yaakov, and you know the story in Genesis 28 that we commonly call Jacob's Ladder. And of course, in, um, in, in Genesis 28, you have Jacob falling asleep. He's on his way to his uncle Laban's. And he has a dream. He sees a ladder from earth to heaven. God is above the ladder. Jacob is actually sleeping. <laughs> and he sees angels ascending and descending on the ladder. He sees angels ascending and descending on the ladder. And when he wakes up, he says, wow, I didn't realize God was here. This is the house of God. He names it Bethel. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. The gate of heaven. This, of course, is brought up again in John chapter 1 in the interaction between Yeshua and Nathaniel, where Nathaniel makes his great confession of faith, and Yeshua says to him, you're going to see great things. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, he's the ladder between heaven and earth that Jacob saw. Angels are going to be ascending and descending on him. In the first account, God is above the ladder. Now God is standing next to Nathaniel. So this was also a repetition of the promises. Exodus 3, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down, I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Slavery in Egypt, God says, I have come down and I'm going to get these people to the land, capital L. Going to get these people to the land, capital L. And look at the prophetic ramifications of this in the New Covenant. We are slaves to sin. We're in slavery to sin. God says, I have come down. Messiah Yeshua, the God-man, the ever-existent God, who then takes on human form, comes to deliver us from that slavery to sin and to take us to the ultimate promised land, which is heaven. That's amazing. So again, this is why Yeshua says all these things point to me because he is the fulfillment of this. But sticking back with the land, this is about the land. Deuteronomy 32, 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Why does he say Jacob? 
Well, Jacob is Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with the man, capital M. So it says God's portion here is his people. The chosen people are his people. That's why they're called the chosen people. And Jacob is the place of his inheritance, which is the land of Israel, the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him and he instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Where did he find Israel? In a howling desert, in a wasteland. He encircled them. He protected them. He instructed them. He kept them. And they're the apple of his eye. Out of a howling wilderness. And of course, that applies to us as well. We're taking out of a howling wilderness because of our faith in Messiah Yeshua. Really pretty amazing. So you, I hope you see the, the 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 parallels there, the fulfillments there, the types and the prefigurements, and then becomes the substance, capital S. Encircled him, instructed him, apple of his eye. We who are Gentiles who follow the Jewish Messiah, who follow Messiah Yeshua, are the apple of his eye. He's instructed us. He's encircled us. He found us in a wasteland and brought us. But here he's actually talking about the land. The chosen people are God's inheritance. And Israel, both the people and the place, are his inheritance. Psalm 147, 2, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. Well, we saw that happen in after the Babylonian exile. And we saw this happen in 1948. It's happened twice. Psalm 114, Judah became his sanctuary in Israel, his dominion. The land of Judah is his sanctuary. Why? Jerusalem is there. The place where he put his name is there. Israel is his dominion. He doesn't say any other place is his dominion. No other place is his dominion. Isaiah 45. But Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. <coughs> Israel was disobedient all through Torah, all through the prophetic writings, all through the writings. They rejected Messiah for the most part. The leaders rejected Messiah. The vast, vast, vast majority of the people rejected Messiah. They were sent into diaspora. But they're not going to be forever ashamed and disgraced because they're going to be saved. Does the new covenant address this? Yes, Romans 11. Paul says all Israel will be saved. The prophet Zechariah talks about this a lot. People will look on him whom they pierced and they'll mourn like you mourn for an only son. You're going to gather the nations around Israel to judge them. And he'll roar from Zion. That kind of roar from anywhere else is going to roar from Zion. And so it all points to his connection to the land. Hosea, another interesting minor prophet, verse 1, 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So when Israel was being formed, remember, a family went into Egypt and a nation came out. So when Israel was young, when they were developing, God loved them. He says, is Ephraim not my son? He loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Here, and you can see the parallel meanings of this, the fulfillment of this. Out of Egypt, he called his son Israel. Who was a child, loved him, called him out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, he called 
his son, capital S, Yeshua, because Joseph was told to take the child and his mother to Egypt <coughs> because Herod was slaughtering the innocent babies. And when Herod died, the angel told Joseph, okay, safe to go back. Which fulfilled, again, out of Egypt I've called my son. Zechariah 8, 3. Again the, word of, again, the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. He is zealous for Zion. Zealous. Not just, yeah, you know, I like it. I kind of like the place to put my name there. Yep. Nice. It's one of the nicest places. No, he says, I'm zealous for Zion. I'm zealous for that land. Just like God says, he's zealous for his name. You can't get any higher thing than his name. He says he's zealous for his name. He's zealous for Zion. That's Zechariah 8.1. I think I might have said 3, but it's 8.1. So he's zealous for that land, for that piece of real estate, not for any place else. And of course, Zechariah 2.8, he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Touches the apple of his eye. So this is all very serious business. Jeremiah 31. We all know Jeremiah 31 as the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 31, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it won't be like the covenant I made with their fathers. The law is going to be written on their hearts. No one is going to have to say, know the Lord, because we'll know him like water covers the ocean. Not a great line. When you come to Messiah Yeshua, you know him, you know God, you understand. Not that you understand, but you understand what's going on. But a little bit farther down in Jeremiah 31, um, at verse 35, is a fascinating passage that doesn't get quoted very much. And again, it's about this connection between God and the land, between God and the people. Jeremiah 31, 35, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Okay. So as he's saying here, he says, I give the sun, I made the sun, I made the sun to give light during the day. I made the moon, I made the stars to give light at night. I caused the ocean waves to form. I caused the sea to roar because I'm the Lord of hosts. This is Adonai Elohim Sabaot, the Lord of the hosts of heaven. If those ordinances depart from me, in other words, if I don't do that stuff anymore, if I can't do it or departs from me in some way, then Israel won't be a nation anymore. So when is that going to be? Never. Then he goes on. Thus says the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. So if you can measure the universe, if you can figure out the foundation of the earth, then I'm going to cast off Israel for all the bad things they've done. 
going to just cast them off. Have they done bad things? Yes. They have. Ultimate rejection of Messiah. But, but I'm not going to cast them off. I'm not going to get rid of them as a nation. I'm not going to cast off their seed just because they've done bad things. Why? Because I made promises to them. And the promises are eternal. He's not going to go back on his promises. So even though they have done bad things, they're not going to cease to exist. And if you think that God is done with Israel, if you think God is done with his people, then the ordinances of the sun and the moon, the ocean, the universe, the earth, are not in his hands anymore. And we know Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes that Yeshua holds together everything in the universe, controls everything in the universe. Well, in order to cast off Israel, then that's going to all have to be out of his hands. So what does that mean? It's not going to happen. Verse 121, 4. 121 is the first psalm of ascent. You would sing this as you were going up the steps to the top of the Temple Mount. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. In other words, God doesn't fall asleep, take his attention off of what's going on, kind of wake up and say, how did that happen? How did I miss that? What's going on over there? He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's not half asleep. He's not sound asleep. He's always watching. In Isaiah, God says, your walls are always before me. He's talking about the walls of Jerusalem are always before him. He always thinks about it. Jeremiah, you know, he says, I, I, I have plans for you. I'm always thinking about you. I have plans for you. So he who keeps Israel, the guard of Israel, the keeper of Israel, doesn't slumber or sleep. And so what does this mean? Well, this means that no matter what has been happening, no matter what we perceive may be happening, two things are clear. Number one, is the Israelites, the Jews, the Hebrew, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> that people are his people. And he doesn't go back on his promises. If he says, you know what, I changed my mind. You know, forget about this ordinance of the sun and moon. Forget about patriarchs. I don't want to deal with that stuff anymore. Besides, you know, I started over when Messiah was here, so let's just forget about all our stuff. Then he would be breaking his promises. <clears throat> when Paul, Saul, was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, all Israel will be saved. Eh, well, I changed my mind about that. I gave up on Israel a long time ago. So, you know, I don't know what Paul was thinking when he wrote that. But no, because if that was the case, then again, God would be going back on his promises. He would be breaking his promises. And if we can't trust his promises, then how do we know what to believe? How do we know he's not going to change his mind again? How do we know he's not going to change his mind about salvation? How do we know he's not going to change his mind of what's in the scriptures in other places? So he's not going to, not going to break his promises. Land, descendants, all the nations of the earth blessed. Messiah going to those people. Messiah coming back. 
Messiah to dwell in Jerusalem, as it says there in Zechariah, going to dwell in Jerusalem. Came and pitched his tent there. He's going to come back to Jerusalem. In fact, I'm not going to look up every scripture, but I should have included it. And of course, in Zechariah, it also says when Messiah comes, his foot's going to touch the top of the Mount of Olives and the mountain is going to split in two. And then he's going to walk into the city through the Eastern Gate. Well, he came into the city through the Eastern Gate on the day we call Palm Sunday, which was the day that the lambs were on display. So people could pick which lamb they were going to use for Passover. Because, of course, all of that had to be fulfilled and be consistent. But that's a different topic. But all these things are going to be fulfilled. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind from the book of Revelation of 144,000 Jews evangelizing and the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from the sky built on the foundation of the apostles and having gates that are named after the tribes. He's not going to change his mind. And so he's connected to the land, he's connected to the people, and the people are connected to the land. There's so many prophecies, like I said before, that could have been included in all of this, and you're probably thinking of some. <coughs> like settling them in the land and never to be moved again. Amos and Ezekiel coming back from the four corners of the world and being brought back to the land. And people say, oh, that just refers to Babylon. Well, no, because it talks about the four corners of the earth. It doesn't just talk about Babylon. It doesn't just talk about the land from the north as uh, Jeremiah describes it. And so the connection to the land, the connection to the people is not going to stop. It's not going to suddenly be nullified. Because these are not only sovereign promises, but they're eternal promises. You know, as God says, I swear by myself, because he can't swear by anything higher. So he swears by himself that these are his promises. And we know from all the prophets I mentioned, and you've probably thought of 16 more, that when Israel is reestablished in the land, and we know that as 1948, they are not going to be displaced again. They are not going to be displaced again. So that's a pretty strong series of promises. And so here we are, at war again, attacked by its neighbors, attacked by radical demonic forces, again, trying to destroy the people, started with the Egyptians, started with, the, went on with the Amalekites, went on to the, through time, through crusaders, through czars, through emperors, through Hitler, to communists, to, to now Islamic terrorism, but from his, to Islamic states, then to terrorism, to destroy the land, the land is not going to be destroyed, and the people are not going to be destroyed. And so it will be interesting to see what goes on from here, whether these are part of the end of the end time events, or if these are just another series of events that are approaching, like Yeshua says, it would be like a woman in labor. We don't know that for sure. We have to watch. We have to keep everything in context. And you have to be very careful about all the wild predictions that people make in 
YouTube videos and podcasts and so forth because we don't know the exact scenario. But Yeshua said, you'll know when the time is close. You'll know when the time is close. And I think probably 80% at least of people would agree now that the time is close. So we'll see what happens in this war. And one thing is for sure, the people are not going to be destroyed. And the land is not going to be destroyed. So last week, you know, on this program, we had um, Brendan Maynard from Chosen People Ministries here in the Cleveland area. And he and I talked about the land and what was going on in the war. Next week, I'm not sure <laughs> what's going to be happening, but there may be a teaching or maybe some more <coughs> sort of current events things. And Brendan will be coming back on. I think it's very important. And, you know, he is here organizing a new chapter of Chosen People Ministries in Cleveland, which, as you may or may not know, has a very high Jewish population. And so we'll be talking with him a lot. But thanks for tuning in. And um, I hope this was useful to you. I know you can find information about Israel and the people and the war in so many places, but I'm glad you tuned in. We are richly blessed to bring you what we believe is the fullest, most diverse, yet up-to-date progressive teachings, discussion, and prayer programming you can find anywhere on this planet. Be sure to take the tour of the MessianicLambRadio.com website. I'm Susan Hoogie, thanking you for joining us on the Messianic Lamb Video Network. <laughs>